Uh, can everyone hear me and uh, see the slides? Yes. yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so Daniel already put this link up, but for those just joining, I'll remind everyone, uh, as we do every day, that this is the one URL you need to know, uh, which has all of the links. Um, in particular, it has the links to the discussion notes. Um, so uh, we're going to need a, a note taker, or ideally even two, if you're willing to, um, to volunteer uh, to capture the discussion. Um, and. Uh, yeah, again, use the link from the, the previous slide to uh, find the, the URL to access the note. So if you could please volunteer in the chat, we'd really, really appreciate that. Um, so the, the first talk of the day is a systemization of knowledge talk, which means there'll be a 30 minute presentation and then a 30 minute discussion. Um, so the, the title of the talk is Formalizing Sigma Protocols and Commitment Schemes uh, Using Crypt HOL. Uh, so our, our speaker is uh, David Butler, um, who is between being a PhD student and a postdoc at the Alan Turing Institute in London. Uh, I understand that the coronavirus has um, possibly delayed this transition for, for David. Uh, but his PhD has been focusing on applying formal methods to cryptography, which is also, of course, the subject of this talk. Um, and he spent some time during his PhD working at NASA applying formal methods, uh, not to crypto, but to safety cases for unmanned aircraft. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'll let David take over uh, for his uh, exciting talk that we're uh, really excited to hear about. Hi, um, thanks. So I should be able to share my screen now. So can everybody see my slides? Hopefully. Yes. Brilliant. Okay, let's actually go back to the beginning of the slides. That would be helpful. Okay, brilliant. So th thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to going to talk today about um, our work on formalizing Sigma protocols and commitment schemes. Although um, we're not really going to talk about commitment schemes at all. J just just focus on Sigma protocols because of their obvious um, application to, to zero knowledge. So let's have a let's have a look at some. Uh, some motivations. Do we have a problem with cryptographic proof? Um, so in 2005, Shai Halevi uh, wrote this uh, fairly famous paper that was, well, very famous paper that, that called for formal methods to be used um, for, uh, in, in the world of cryptography. So apply formal methods to, to cryptography. And in this paper, he sort of said, um, the problem is that as a community, we generate more proofs than we carefully verify. Um, in 2004, so a year before, Belair and Rogaway uh, perhaps were, were more harsh, were more damning. They said that many, many proofs in cryptography are, are essentially unverifiable. Uh, the field may be approaching a crisis of rigor. Uh, and then a sort of lighthearted quote uh, from the Bristol Crypto Group. They had this sort of blog that they update, I think, once a week or once a month. They say that security proof, even for simple uh, cryptographic systems, are dangerous and ugly beasts. Luckily, they're only rarely seen, um, usually kept in the confines of future full versions of papers, but only appear in cartoonish form, generically labeled as proof sketch. So although that last, that last quote is a bit sort of tongue in cheek, um, we, we get the idea here that cryptographers understand that there may be an issue with, with, with the types of proofs that they're, they're developing. Um, this is because they're getting complex, there's lots of cases to consider, and in particular, it's very important to get it right because the real world uh, sort of implications of, of incorrect proofs here is, is, is it's big problems, right? Um, so one method that we might be able to alleviate this crisis of rigor is the idea of having machine check proofs. Uh, now, before I actually sort of go into too much else, I'm go I want to actually just show you what a machine check proof um, looks like. So hopefully here, you, my screen has changed um, and you'll see Isabel. So this is a theorem prover. This is what we're dealing with in, in this work. Um, so, so it's gonna look like a bit of sort of magic at the moment, but we'll try and break it down a little bit. So we're able to sort of prove lemmas, okay? We can also make definitions. And the two kind of parts of the screen that we're looking at is this bit where I, the prover, can write text and I can write my lemmas. Uh, and then this second bit here uh, down the bottom, hopefully you can all see my mouse, where we're told what we need to prove. So this is sort of Isabel telling me what's happening. Um, and this line that I've just altered here uh, is, is proving it. So we can see that if I do, we don't need to worry about what these, this sort of command means, but it's now saying, okay, I've got no sub goals. Isabel is now happy that this very simple lemma is true. Um, so that's the idea. I'm interacting with the, with the machine and the proof assistant to prove that these things, uh, the, prove these results. Um, 
Now, one of the interesting things about proof assistance that I want to point out is that at every point I sort of run the script, or in this case, actually just, just sort of scroll down, uh, everything gets checked every time. So it can be seen, if you look on the right-hand side, we have this red. If, if we look down, this is going to disappear, okay? And we'll get to the bottom in a second. And Isabel is now happy, uh, you know, everything's ended and there are no errors. Um, fantastic. So what, ha what does it look like when there's a mistake? So actually, I'll just show you here, we have an assumption. Okay, the assumption here is that we've got some prime, prime group. Let's just take that assumption out. Um, okay, so Isabel's immediately telling me that it doesn't like this lemma anymore. This proof doesn't go through. Uh, and in particular, if we scroll to the bottom, we can find all the other places where Isabel is no longer happy um, that this, you know, because this assumption that we had, it doesn't matter what this was for. This is for the Schnorr Sigma protocol that we'll consider later. But Isabel is now not happy that it's, that it's correct. Uh, and we can pinpoint exactly where um, things have gone wrong. No? So hopefully we're back on my slides. Um, so we, we now are all on, on a sort of similar page as to what a theorem prover looks like. And what do machine check proofs uh, give us? So firstly, they give us this high guarantee of correctness. Um, we're proving all our statements correct with respect to this, uh, this sort of small logical kernel that's behind the proof assistance, this small amount of code that's been rigorously checked uh, by humans. Uh, we, we can explicitly make assumptions and definitions. We can explicitly define these in the theorem prover. Um, yeah, so all parts of a proof uh, have to be proven to be valid in, in a machine check proof. We, we can't have gaps. This is uh, the kind of the famous bit in the paper where you have, oh, this is trivial, or we leave this to the reader to sort of check that this is correct. And sometimes these are not so trivial things. Um, so we can't get away with that with, with theorem proving. Uh, so in general, we're able to increase the level of, rig of rigor in our proofs, which is, which is I guess, what, what is desired. There's one big caveat to all of this, that the human checker is still important. Uh, the human checker needs to check that the definitions and the sort of in particular here, the definitions of, the of security that we make um, are, are, are correct. You know, they've been transcribed from the, from the paper definitions correctly. We've captured the definitions correctly. Uh, and this is a sort of big caveat. So we still need the human to check this. But what is alleviated is this big effort to actually check the proof because we can just let Isabel check this proof, um, which reduces the effort, it reduces the effort on the sort of verifier, the human end of the verifying um, completely. So what's been done uh, so far? So since Halevi had his uh, wrote this sort of call to arms for the use of formal methods in cryptography, we've had lots of lots of tools made by the formal community um, to, to help reason about cryptography formally. And just just a few of them are, are on this slide. Perhaps the one people, if any, if you've heard of any, perhaps EasyCrypt is the one you've heard of. This is probably the most famous. Uh, it's probably the, the most widely used in the formal community and um, probably the one that's infiltrated the crypto community the most. Uh, but, but we actually use, in this work, we use Cryptol, mainly because Isabel uh, is the language that, that, I, that I use. And no, and we use this to, uh, to consider Sigma protocols and commitment schemes, but we, we won't discuss those at all here. So what do I hope to do? In this, ooh, in this talk. Um, so I want to sort of go through three, three things really. First, I want to try to uh, show you how I think formal methods can be beneficial. And I'll do this with a case study uh, of what we've learned from this work. Uh, and then I want to actually go into some slightly more details about how the formalization works, give you hopefully an understanding of the workflow or the process we need to go through to formalize results. And then I want to start promoting this discussion that we'll have for the rest of the session. Um, how can this work uh, continue? Not necessarily uh, with SIGM protocols, but how can we maybe extend it to zero knowledge? Or in particular, how can it influence standardization? Because that's the sort of one of the things that we're, we're dealing with in this workshop. Uh, how can we integrate maybe formal methods with, with the standardization process? Okay, so we need one slide uh, just to get on the same page about SIGM protocols, basically for, for sort of notation reasons. But we have a prover and a verifier in this relation R. Uh, the prover P wants to prove that they know uh, a witness to this public input H such that it's in the relation. Uh, so what does this look like? Sigma protocols are this three-step format. Uh, the first, where we have this initial message sent from a prover to a verifier. Uh, this initial message is A, but we also produce some randomness that we use later. Uh, the verifier then, then sends a challenge back, and then the prover responds and the verifier decides whether whether they accept or reject uh, by, by checking uh, the response. Uh, here we call A, E and R the, the conversation of the protocol. This will sort of come back in a little bit, so it's important that we, we know that what the conversation is. And our, our properties are these, are these three fairly standard properties. Okay, we want completeness, uh, this soundness property, uh, and then this zero knowledge property. But the key for 
uh, signal protocols is that we have honest verifiers here in knowledge. So sort of the caveat with signal protocols is that the verifier is assumed to be honest throughout. Um, so that's us on signal protocols, and that's kind of all we're really going to deal with with the sort of technical crypto there. Um, okay, so now I want to sort of move on to the first point of my of my talk to try and convince you that formal methods is useful uh, by looking at uh, the definition of, of uh, honest verifier zero knowledge. So here on this screen, on this slide, is, is a standard textbook definition of, of zero knowledge. Um, this is basically a standard simulation definition. I don't, I don't want to go through all the details here, but we can see we have a simulator M. Uh, and then the key bit, I think it's on the slide. Yeah, the key bit here is that uh, we have some input that's in the relation, some X and W. And then we need to show uh, what happened. Well, what we need, the requirement is that the simulator M, the output of the simulator is the same as the real execution of the protocol. So it's a very standard simulation based definition. Uh, but the key here I want to point out is that it only tells us what's happening when X and W are in the relation. It doesn't tell us what happens when they're not in the relation. And actually we find that this leads to a, a little bit of confusion or a little bit of a problem uh, when we consider this, this OR construction of sigma protocols, so combining two sigma protocols uh, in, in an OR relation. And we found that this is a bit of a problem, and I'll try and explain what's going on here. So what's the relation that we want to consider for this, for this OR protocol? So we have, we have two public inputs, this X0 and X1, and the prover wants to prove that it knows a witness W for one or the other. So either this relation uh, is valid or this relation is valid uh, for, for the given witness. Now it, it, here we have the same relation, but actually we could be off two different relations. Uh, so we could be considering two different sigma protocols here. So what do we know from this relation? We know that one of the public values uh, is in the relation with W, but there's actually no restriction on the other value. The, the, other, the other public value could be anything according to this relation. Uh, in particular, it doesn't have to be in this sort of language, which is defined by the relation at all. What, what we have here is, is very expressive. Uh, the issue that we find here is that the honest verifier zero knowledge uh, definition or this property is actually needed uh, in the proof of completeness. But the honest verifier definition doesn't tell us how to deal uh, with anything that's not in the language. It only tells us what to do when uh, X and W are in the relation. In particular, we find that the, the proof of completeness breaks down uh, when we don't know what to do here. So what, what's the problem here? Or what's the solution? Um, the, we need the property that always outputs a valid conversation. So that's not only when uh, X and W are in a relation, but also it needs to output a valid conversation when they're not in the relation. This, is, this just needs to, needs to be the case. Uh, and with this condition, we find that the proof is always valid. Um, so that, that's fantastic, but what do we do here? Do, do we need to change the definition? Uh, that seems like quite a cool step. Like, luck sigma protocols that we're aware of, and I, I think all sigma protocols, I'd like to probably put that out there, that all sigma protocols have this property, so maybe it's not such a radical thing. Um, but we then started to think, but well, surely we're not the only people that have ever noticed this. Um, surely someone's noticed this is, this is a problem before, um, and it's not just that we've just sort of come stumbled across this. Uh, and yes, we went looking in the literature, and in Kramer's thesis, this is where Sigma protocols uh, first began, we, we, found, uh, we found that he did require this, and we'll have a look at this in a second. But I'd just like to note that uh, in all our other sort of literature surveying of all the definitions, which was semi-thorough, uh, we couldn't actually find this property. So, so this was the only place that we actually found this property. So we went looking, we found Kramer's PhD thesis, uh, in the middle of page 27, uh, this is what we found. So in the middle of this text, we, we found this text. If we zoom in a little bit further, uh, we find that it does tell us what to do um, when things are not in the relation. Uh, the notations change slightly here, but ooh, I think we get the idea that X um, is somehow not in this relation. And if we look at this line above, it's actually slightly obscured by this green line, but Kramer even tells us um, what what's happening, what, what the need for this is. Um, uh, apparently my connection's slightly going sometimes, so I'm sorry, I don't think there's so much I can do about that. Um, uh, you, you might be able to reduce your bandwidth um, on the video. Yeah, let me try. Any suggestions on actually how to do that? I don't know how to do it on Zoom, sorry. No. So I think um, it should be on video settings. Uh, if you on the little arrow next to the video 
uh, icon. You can do Next video settings. Video. Ah, down here. Okay. Uh, choose a uh, video settings. What do we reckon we're going to? Mm -hmm. Is there anything else to go to on after that? Okay, maybe uh, I don't know. But let's let's continue. We can, yeah. Okay. So, okay. In my can I take this opportunity to ask a question? Yes. Uh, so I'm I'm a bit confused. So. Uh, you're right that zero knowledge does not give any guarantees about X is not in the language, about simulation. But yeah. there's two things that I, I didn't understand. So first, when you talk about or, well, it's a new language and now you have a witness. I mean, if you talk about honest verifiers, your knowledge for the or language, now you do have a witness. So I, I wasn't really, wasn't clear to me exactly the issue, but hold on, I want to continue, then you'll, you can decide which part to, add, to answer. But also, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the problem because if the language is hard, in a sense, then the simulator can't, this, this polynomial time simulator can't distinguish between X in the language and X out of the language. So just by the hardness of the language, he generates a transcript that is accepted. Otherwise you can use him to break the NP language. So I guess I'm not really, I, I don't yeah, understand. Uh, so I, the fact that the language, yeah. Um, so I think the fact that language is hard, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, we're all really dealing with here is the fact that the, the definitions uh, throw this up. So, so in the proof, in the proof of the uh, completeness property for the OR protocol, we need this fundamental property on the underlying relation. So, so that, that's why that's why we need this. Can I ask a clarifying question? I think I was puzzled by it, but I think I, I, I figured it out. So I think you want to uh, compose kind of two sigma protocols, or in this case here, yeah. the, 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 the same see. sigma protocol. And for, in order for that composition to, to work, you need uh, this property, right? I so see. You know exactly. so, so. It's, this, it's this composition together. Okay, so because uh, what you're doing underlying what you want to do is actually yes. composing. That's kind of your technique, yes. and that's why you need yes. it. I see, yeah. okay. So, so thank, thank you for clarifying, that's, that's helpful. Um, so if I share my screen again, hopefully we can, sorry about that, um, we, can, we can get back to where we are. Okay, so we find that in, basically we find that in Kramer's thesis, we actually have this property. Uh, and so, so somebody has noticed this before, which is, which is a relief. Um, and he even notes why we need to uh, have this completeness property, um, why we need to have this property uh, of when it's not in the relation for these completeness um, of, of the protocols to follow. The key, the key thing that I want to point out here is that the, uh, the idea that this was defined in the original literature, uh, but hasn't somehow filtered down into the modern textbook uh, definition, at least, at least from what we could find. So hopefully what this has shown, uh, this sort of little case study, is that uh, formal methods can catch these subtle points, um, th these things that are perhaps are overlooked in the literature because they're deemed very, very trivial. And it certainly wasn't a, a big issue when we changed the proof, but formal methods can catch these, these subtleties. So in, in the rest of this talk, I want to first sort of give an idea of how formalization happens, uh, this sort of workflow from defining security to then instantiating it for, for real protocols. And then I want to try and promote this discussion um, to, to, to influence the rest of the session and um, to give some ideas about perhaps what we can talk about. Uh, so to start with, we need to, we need to just quickly introduce Isabel and Cryptol, the sort of notation. Isabel is a, is a very well developed theorem prover. It um, is sort of one of the more traditional, one of the oldest uh, sort of ones that are currently in use, uh, famously used for, for the proof, the formal proof of the Kepler conjecture, uh, which is probably it's a highlight in, in terms of mathematics at least. Uh, and Cryptol is embedded in this theorem prover, and it's a framework for working, working out uh, reasoning about cryptography. Uh, and in particular, it provides us with a, with a probabilistic programming framework. Um, and the, this, this framework has been shown that it can be successful to, to look at game-based proofs or simulation-based proofs. Um, but, but what does it look like? Let, let's try and understand what it, what it looks like. Um, here, we're going to look at the definition of this initial message sent by uh, the Schnorr Sigma protocol. Uh, I just want to understand how the probabilistic, how a probabilistic program looks. Uh, so let's ignore the, this first line really. It's just telling us it's a definition and giving us its type. Uh, and then let's also ignore these quotes. Uh, people often get confused by the quotes in Isabel, but they, they're just needed around any whole statement. 
Um, and, and we're looking at the function here. So the function has two inputs, um, H, H and W. This is the, the public input. Sorry, I've been switching between H and X, I realize now. Uh, and W, there's no parentheses because it's a, it's a functional language. And then we go inside this, this probability monad, uh, this do notation. We do some sampling uh, and then we exit. It's a very simple program. We then exit immediately uh, by returning our probability function. Uh, we return the randomness and uh, we return this initial message, which is just g to the r. So that's basically what it looks like there. Uh, so we want to use this probabilistic uh, language to start defining security. Um, and to define security, we first want to do this at a very abstract level. We want to do this uh, not considering exactly what protocols we're, we're looking at. We just want to fix some parameters uh, to make these security definitions. Um, and Isabel has got this, this lovely expressive module system uh, that's actually called locales in Isabel, where, where we can do this. So all we're doing here is setting up our, our module in which we will make our formal definitions um, that we can then, we can then use later on. So what do we do? We need to fix the parameters of the Sigma protocol. So we fix this initial function. This is the, the function that sends uh, the first message. We fix what the response looks like uh, and what the check looks like, and then the actual relation. And this is just the simulator, the, the SAMless adversary, and then a couple of constructs of the actual formalization that we're not gonna worry about. Uh, and just one assumption here. Uh, it doesn't matter what this assumption is, that we, we just, we require this one, this one assumption that we'll, we'll come back to later. Uh, and using these parameters, so all we've done here is fix the types of the parameters. They're very, very general. Uh, we can make our definitions. So here, the honest verifier zero knowledge definition uh, looks like this. So we quantify over all um, challenges that are in this, this challenge space that we've fixed. And then we have two parts of the definition that are on these two lines separated by the and. Uh, so the first part for all uh, H and W that are in the relation, we want this real view, uh, which is defined using uh, the protocol. So these three things here uh, is the same as a simulator. So that's exactly the same as the definition we saw earlier. But then we also need this additional property um, that says all uh, inputs to the simulator, no matter if they're in the relation or not, must output a valid uh, must output a valid conversation. So let's just try and pass this quickly. Okay, so for all public inputs, this is okay. We just need to quantify over this. Um, all conversations that come out of the simulator. Uh, read this as the support set of the simulator because we're dealing with probabilistic programs. So all conversations that come out of this um, check. So they all are valid conversations. And that's all we want. So now we've defined our property, which is great. So I want to just have a look at one technical slide um, on how we actually maybe instantiate these abstract definitions uh, for the particular protocol we want to consider. So we have this abstract uh, module that defines our properties and we now want to instantiate this. And we do this using Isabel's uh, sublocale mechanism. So this is like creating an instance of a module. Uh, so what we would do is define all of the points of the Schnorr Sigma protocol. That's the, sigma, that's the protocol we're now considering. So we'll make the definitions uh, implicit for, for what the um, parameters actually are for the Sigma protocol. So it's the initial function, the response, the check and so on and the actual relation. Um, and then we'll prove them, we'll prove this instance sort of correct, uh, sort of valid with respect to that initial abstract definition that we made. Um, and that's all this line is doing. So it's saying, remember we had that one assumption that we made that was something about the valid inputs. Uh, so we just need to show that this instance, that, that still holds. And once we've done that, we have access to all the definitions um, that, that we want and we can start to prove the properties of the instantiation. So we then, we then to start to prove uh, we start to prove properties uh, like this. So we prove the honest verifier zero knowledge property um, of the Schnorr Sigma protocol. And we prove the soundness and the completeness and everything else that we want to prove, uh, eventually showing perhaps that, well, showing that we have a, a Sigma protocol. Uh, and that's what we want to do. So hopefully that's giving you an idea uh, of the sort of workflow that we go through, the process that we go through to actually formalize these things, starting with this abstract definition um, and ending with some sort of actual proof like we would see on, on paper of the Schnorr protocol. One other thing I, I want to highlight um, in Isabel, so I, I've talked a lot about this modularization, but to show sort of how this comes quite naturally still. Um, in paper proofs, we often want to make assumptions on the underlying protocols. Um, and hopefully I'll show you how this can be done in Isabel. 
So when we consider this OR construction, what, what did we want to consider? Well, really what we had written on paper is something like, well, we have two different signal protocols, the underlying protocols that we then form this construction on top of. Uh, so what can we do here? So we, we form our module uh, and then we fix, we sort of instantiate our two sigma protocols, so sigma zero and sigma one. And all we're doing here is sort of introducing the parameters of these protocols, not worrying about exactly which one it is, whether it's a Schnorr, whether it's Yokomoto, um, but we're fixing these. Um, so, so we're fixing the underlying protocols. We're then going to ignore these sort of three lines here. These are just uh, for what, what, what we require to write in Isabel. Uh, we fix this, this Boolean algebra that the whole thing runs over. But the important thing I want to point out was we then made, can very easily make our assumptions on these two protocols. In particular, we can uh, make the assumption that they are in fact Sigma protocols, um, which is exactly what we want to do. And we can now re um, reason about them like this. So finally, on sort of a, a semi-technical point, I just want to overview the actual work that, that we do here. Um, we define uh, Sigma protocols and we define commitment schemes and their properties and then prove a few instantiations. I say numerous, but you know, a few instantiations uh, and constructions. So, so we prove some uh, Sigma protocols with respect to our Sigma protocol definition. And we prove some commitment schemes secure with respect to these definitions. Uh, but I want to point out this arrow, um, this sort of big arrow, the different arrow that we have going from Sigma protocols to commitment schemes. Um, and point out that, well, well, we all know that we have this, this construction uh, from signal protocols that create a commitment scheme. So we're able to actually prove this at an abstract level, um, which is good because it means that we make one proof and then all of the instantiated proofs from the signal protocols. So using the Schnorr signal protocol, we create the Pedersen commitment scheme. Uh, all those proofs sort of come for free once we've actually proven the Schnorr protocol or proven the, the corresponding signal protocol. Uh, secure. So that, that's, that's nice. It reduces our proof effort eventually. Um, so that's everything that I want to talk about in terms of the actual work that we do. And now I want to take a little bit of time um, to sort of try and promote, uh, promote the discussion that hopefully we'll have in, in the next part of the session. So in particular, I want to look at uh, future directions uh, of formal methods and this work, but in general, just future directions of, of formal methods. Um, so first I want to consider what, what's most beneficial from a formalization effort? Um, do we just want to formalize basic definitions and have, well, definitions and basic case studies? So for example, do we want to just formalize the definitions of Sigma protocols and then prove the Schnorr protocol is correct? Is that enough if we then capture the definitions uh, correctly? Or do we want to consider more complex construction? Um, maybe look at modularization. So I thought we'd look at that uh, in, oh, and everything here is obviously that there's this trade-off um, between the proof effort and what we do, you know, a lot of this takes quite a lot of man hours to, to formalize. Uh, so there's this trade off uh, between the more complex stuff we do and the time it takes. So I thought we'd consider um, this idea with the honest verifier zero knowledge definition, this sort of issue that we encountered and how, how we would have got to that maybe if we didn't uh, consider the more complex constructions. So initially we formalized the definitions from the literature. That's the one I first show you, the one that um, you know, didn't have this extra property. And we actually found that everything was fine uh, when we considered these basic constructions. So when we considered the Schnorr protocol and the Okamoto, everything was fine. Uh, we didn't notice anything was wrong, but it was only when we considered this or compound construction uh, that we realized the proof went through. Uh, this sort of led us to re-examine the paper definitions and, and the paper proofs and sort of note, oh, this is where we think the problem is. And we, we were able to sort of trace back to find Kramer and then work out what was going on. So perhaps in this instance, if we had only done point one here, this sort of issue with the, with the definition wouldn't, wouldn't have been caught. Maybe it would have, I don't know, but that gives you an idea of the sort of the trade-off that, that we're talking about here. Uh, the second thing I want to, want to talk about is this idea of having machine hybrid, uh, machine paper hybrid proofs. And I'll try and explain what I mean here. Um, so we don't have to have fully mechanized proofs. Uh, you know, a, a fully machine check proof is nice, but it takes a long time. Um, so maybe that's not always desirable. Maybe we can focus our formal effort on the parts where we know intuition breaks down. So perhaps there are points where um, cryptographers know that their intuition sometimes breaks and we can focus there. Um, and the, in particular, the paper proof could consider uh, the safe parts of the proof, the, the bits that we know are fine and we, we focus on the hard bits in, in the formalization. Uh, but I think what this point is getting around, this idea of formal methods being used as a sort of prototyping environment. 
Uh, we don't need to prove absolutely everything, but I think once you get used to these tools, often they become quite intuitive and you can play around with them and play around with your ideas to see if you think they work or not. Um, and the last point I want to want to sort of uh, emphasize or, or point out is perhaps we can use formal methods to influence standardization um, as, as this workshop is sort of considering standardization. Um, what, what often happens here is that a standard is set, the standard committee works hard to, to set a standard and then they release it. And the formal methods community um, jumps on it and sort of does their analysis. And often they come back with, with interesting suggestions. A, a good example of this is when TLS was formally modeled. Um, that, that this was modeled to a really good degree of complexity. And this actually resulted in a change of the standard. Um, so this idea that formal methods could really input to the standard was realized. Um, so maybe we, we're able to somehow integrate formal methods in, into the standardization process. Um, and maybe some sort of iterative approach will, will result in a, in a more robust standardization. Uh, but I, I guess this is for the community to discuss. Um, and that's all that I actually wanted to, 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 to say, uh, but these are, try and leave this slide up that maybe can promote the initial part of the discussion. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, I guess we can start the discussion um, just by seeing if anybody has any um, like questions immediately following the talk before jumping into uh, just a far reaching um, broader discussion. Um, I, I guess I have an open-ended question a, a little bit, uh, which is um, uh, you, you mentioned the, um, the more complicated the protocols we try to formally verify, you know, the more man hours it, it takes and, and so forth. So there, um, and of course, some of the general purpose snarks um, are very complicated indeed. So the, the aspects you have now formalized um, are just like, you know, the, the basic building blocks of these much more complicated snarks. Do you have a sense of um, whether it's even feasible to uh, attempt to formalize um, some of the state of the art general purpose? Kind of, yeah. yeah, so I guess this, this, is, this is the inherent problem with formalization. Formalization moves at a much slower pace because telling a, you know, telling a computer how, how something is proven, it is a lot more difficult. Um, so we, we've had, there's been successes in the formal community. I mean, We've had things like UC, the very basics of UC has been, has been formalized and sort of constructive cryptography. So, so I think things are getting there, but uh, the idea that we're able to do genuinely state of the art is, is I, as I think, a little bit beyond us at the moment. Um, so perhaps this idea that we can have this foundational look at the definitions is, is more appropriate at, at this moment. Um, so yeah, no, I, I fully appreciate that the, at, the, at this point, tools are not available um, to, to look at state-of-the-art things because I think constructions get far too complex too quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose so, that... Oh. Go ahead. You can you, you finish your thoughts, Justin. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I guess like Sigma protocols are like one building block, you know, Schnorr and Peterson commitments and so forth that get used kind of over and over again in a often black box way in these more complicated constructions, but there are other things like the sum check protocol and univariate versions of that and, and so forth. Um, I guess um, it could be worthwhile to just check off each of these building blocks one at a time um, and try to mimic the modular um, way that, you know, uh, we as theorists put them together. Yeah, completely. And I think that I think that's one way that the that, that formal method is able to, to help here by sort of checking that these real foundations are kind of sound. And then that just gives us uh, just gives us more confidence um, in everything that it's built upon. Um, yeah, so, so I think, yeah, completely building up this kind of arsenal of, um, of things to work from is, is very useful. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a question stepping back though, for uh, to going back to what is the goal of uh, formal verification? In particular, uh, are, should I think when I run a formal verification, is my goal to convince myself that my proof is correct, you know, because it, it was uh, machine checked? Or is my goal to convince the community uh, that my proof is correct? 
it's not the same thing. So no, 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 completely not. And perhaps there are different. Uh, there, there are different uh, two different things to consider. So maybe you could use it as this prototyping environment um, to convince yourself. You know, you play around and you're a little bit unsure occasionally about some of the ideas, and you play around and then that increases your confidence to then uh, write your paper proof. In particular, it may actually point out the bits in your paper proof you need to explain much more thoroughly because they're the bits that were slightly more difficult. Uh, but then obviously it would, be, it would be fantastic, I think, if every crypto submission had a, an entire formalization that went with it so that we didn't have to check the proof. But this is, I think, completely unrealistic um, at the moment. But when you think of formalization, what's your goal? Like maybe not for today, but thinking maybe a little more long term, even though I know that this workshop is kind of about standardization, we want to have, but, but still I want to think for a second in the long term, what, what is your goal? Is your goal to be able? My, my, my goal, my goal, my realistic goal would be if we could collect together, if we could define, um, if we could create a set of definitions that were formalized. So in particular, when we're looking at a standard, we, we, form, we have some definitions that we make into a standard. If we could at least formalize these definitions and everybody in some sort of readable way, and then everybody can at least reference those definitions. Because I think often we, we have a problem where um, referencing different definitions that are subtly different. Uh, sometimes the, the ordering of quantifiers is slightly different or it's just, but if we, if we can formalize things and have them in one place and everybody at least refers to these definitions, then I think that that's a, that's a really good start. Um, can I make a comment? And, and actually quite a, quite an end goal. Yes, please. Hello. Yes. Yeah, so um, there was this question of whether more complicated proof systems have been formalized. So the, the, the best work I am aware of is a formalization of a, I think it's a, com it's a kind of the automatization of a C program of a simple C program, I think using CompCert to like a, a QAP or a kind of a first rank constraint system. That's the kind of paper I, I, I cited in the chat. I think that's quite, quite impressive. I mean, it's, it's a simple compiler. It's, it's not as efficient. Maybe it doesn't have all the bells and whistles and optimizations, but I think a lot is possible. It's just um, a lot of um, hard manual labor. And uh, I think it only pays off if it is continued, if you kind of build a community around um, those tools. Yes, yeah, so I, I think that's a really important point, actually, Markov. The fact that at the moment, most of these tools sit in the formal community and, and people have been trying to sort of put them to, towards the crypto community, but for, for whatever reason, there, there's not so much take up. And this is most likely because the tools are not accessible enough. I mean, the barrier to entry to use these tools is often very high, uh, which needs to be developed by the formal community. Um, and, and this is one of the problems because at the moment, it, it, it's developed by a community that's outside of the security or crypto community. Um, because um, accessible. On the line of what you're saying, what do you think are the challenges, for instance, on uh, working on formalizing on the top of implementation that already exists? I think, for instance, in the case of uh, most zero you know, knowledge proof system that we have right now, we have a lot of implementation in like Rust, which is already functional. So we have a strong type system on the top of it. What do you think are the challenges on uh, just putting lemmas on the top of it and just proving? things. I think this would sort of remove a big barrier. Yes. Yeah, yeah completely. So it's, it's this idea of having this kind of end to end uh, implementationally verified uh, proof, which is kind of somewhat this holy grail um, of the area, maybe. Um, I think in short, I think it's very difficult. I don't think any of the tools available at the moment are, um, are, are suitable for this because they often come at it from kind of the other way. They come at it from defining low level security. Uh, rather than coming at it from a sort of top-down approach, looking at the implementation, uh, that there are these methods that you can export code from from some theorem provers, uh, but you know whether that code will ever actually be used um, is also very unlikely. So yeah, I, I, th I think it's a long way off, but I think this is like the holy grail, right, to, to be able to verify implementations. And also, all these proofs that you're talking about are in the Dolevyao model. Like, I don't have any computational assumption. I'm just assuming encryption is perfect, or no, no. So here, here we work in the in the computational model. So um, yes, so, so we make our we we reduce the hardness assumptions and things like this. Um, yeah. You mentioned I, that formal verification tools are often easier if you have sort of some of it done by the by the computer tool and some of it done by the human. This sort of interaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think if we got that right, we would be able to formalize more state-of-the-art protocols or even with that, would it still be a long way off? 
I think you certainly reduce the proof effort. I think you have to be very wary because often, often when you do this, you sort of push, you push the hard bits in the formalization to the paper proof, or you kind of push it to this boundary between the paper proof and, and, and not right. So, um, you know, you push the little issues that, that are really bugging you and you sort of sidetrack them. you push them into one corner and then you claim that everything's okay on the in the paper proof. So it's kind of going back to square one. Um, so I think that, that that area of research really needs to be developed to have some understanding of exactly the processes you have to go through to get this link, because that, that, that link is the real crucial thing. Um, but yes, for sure, doing things like that would reduce the man hours. Uh, because I, I often think that you learn, um, you learn 80% of what you're going to learn from the formalization with 50% of the effort. But that last 20% uh, of, of doing the formalization takes half the time which kind of is a bit in counterintuitive, right? So, so you've learned where all the mistakes are beforehand, but just pushing the actual final proof through um, just takes so much time because it's all, you know, telling a computer to do these things is not trivial. Any more questions, remarks? Um, I guess uh, one thing I'd like to hear if anyone has any thoughts on. So this, um, this, this topic of, you know, uh, in standardization and formal methods um, and where do they meet. Um, so I guess the TLS example um, in that setting, the community settled on like one protocol and then there was this big uh, effort devoted to making sure that protocol was essentially secure, right? It doesn't seem like the ZK proof community will wind up with, you know, saying, oh, this is the protocol, everyone's going to use it, that's it. Um, so I'm just wondering if anyone has any thoughts then, you know, it doesn't seem like an exact analogy to the TLS situation on uh, how formal methods and standardization should interact. So one thing I think is that with zero knowledge, the, the field is still moving very quickly. And I think that is not well conducive to a lot of things that is necessary for formal methods. It takes a lot of time to do formal methods right. and. Uh, at the speed that things are developing right now, uh, maybe you could uh, formally, even, even if you, for example, had a formal proof of GROF16, there's no guarantee that in a year's time that will be what people are using anymore. So I think that some of the things that have been suggested here with going down the route of trying to make sure the building blocks are uh, well-founded is, is sensible. And there are certainly things that can be done, but it, it does seem more difficult to do it to quite the extent that, as you mentioned, has been done in, uh, in the case of TLS, for example. Uh, I mean, I think it's worth saying TLS, the, the, the primitives that it's based on have been, were set in stone long before the formalization effort there got as far as it did. Yeah, I mean, on the other hand, I think standardizing Sigma protocols might be not such a bad idea. They are used, um, very often and um, I think and their formalization might help as uh, as has been shown I, I yeah I don't know what what exactly one would standardize if one standardizes sigma protocols what the properties should be and maybe some default discrete logarithm um, protocols um, how to do them what should be hashed I mean there, there are still things that go wrong in, in, in practical implementations even so this is quite standard so actually, I have a question about that. Uh, so talking about standardization and also Dave, your remark about uh, formalizing definitions. Uh, so I understand what it means to, for a machine to check a proof, you know, they go, go say it checks or not. I'm not really sure what you mean by a, mach a verify, like a, def a formal definition. Uh, I, so I guess, you know, when I write a definition, is it, it the machine check what does the machine check here you know i i'm not sure what that even means so well, well you, you you would then prove a property with respect to the definition that you've made so so oh. so, so we are able to encode somehow the the honest verify zero knowledge definition um and then we we do all this work to get to set the schnorr protocol up to instantiate it and then we prove that the schnorr ha protocol has this property okay but that's a proof that's a formal proof about schnorr so I guess my question is, because it seems like, you know, like you guys all said, the zero knowledge effort is an ongoing effort and it's not clear, as uh, Thomas said, it's not clear, you know, if we're 
going to do formal proof of something now that it's going to be relevant a few years and so on. That I completely agree. But there is something about the definitions, you know, that we do want to kind of standardize, you know, our goals, uh, okay. our holy grails. Uh, my question is, uh, and, and I agree with you, Dave, completely that in all our definitions that we use should be at least, we should all use the same definitions. And I agree with you that sometimes people define the same things in different ways. And that, that's a, you know, a bug in our, for our community <laughs> that that happens. So it is important to have definitions that are standardized and everybody's using them. Uh, but I'm not sure I would, I, I want to understand better. What do you mean by formal for a definition, not then how it's used to prove something else? But, but it's, it's this idea of capturing uh, the definition inside a formal, uh, inside a formal statement in, in a formal language. So, so what, immediately what this gives you is the idea that it's sort of type correct. Um, so really basic things like are the inputs all you know, of the correct type. So it gives you these, these ideas. But also it just allows you to capture uh, the essence of what you mean by the definition. Um, and it's kind of there once and for all for everybody to see rather than having to hunt through necessarily you know obviously you have to hunt through the formalization to maybe find it but i th i think uh and maybe markov has 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 some I, mean, I think uh, it's it's such an easy question i mean the answer is so obvious that it's hard to answer i think i mean it's just expressed using formal logic rather than informal logic it's the same definition but they're written yeah. as a program i mean i guess what you get is that uh, if you write your definition in english there is always some some tiny bits of ambiguity Mm -hmm. And if you write it down in a formal way, then you get rid of that, mm -hmm. those tiny bits. Mm -hmm. but, but what it is important to do, I think, is to have at least some formal proofs because you, you have to uh, realize that this the definition that you've written down that may look correct actually is realizable somehow with some simple protocol. Um, otherwise, you, know, you, you, you may be barking up the wrong tree, I guess. Um. Can you can you uh, can you guys hear me? Sorry. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, I just have uh, something to say to bounce on what Thomas said before, uh, with the fact that uh, that's for sure. Like the space is moving very quickly. We have new schemes like every now and then, um, but I still believe that it may be still quite good to start standardizing and uh, formally verifying like systems such as Rust 16, which are widely used, um, in the sense that um, I don't see like the community reaching, reaching consensus on which proof system should be ruling them all anytime soon, just because it's, all, it's, it's, uh, it's a matter of trade-offs, depending on how you define um, efficiency, whether you favor you know, bandwidth uh, complexity or uh, so proof size basically, or whether you consider like proof of complexity, verify complexity and so on. And so I still believe that we will still have a collection of protocols that we, need, we will need to pick depending on the applications and um, to that regard, I believe that there's massive room for uh, starting to formally verify in Grow16. And just as a side note, now that I have the mic, um, I also believe that formal methods would play a massive role in formally verifying our ones programs, or well, arithmetic, well, program exp expressed in, in the arithmetization of your choice, um, because to anyone who has written our one CS programs in the past, and maybe this is the same in air for people using Starks and stuff like that, um, like people may have experienced that this is very, very complicated to do right because forgetting a single gate in your program is basically failing to capture the intent of what you wanted to implement in the first place. So this is actually quite, quite uh, dodgy. And, um, and I believe that uh, formally verifying programs in the sense of proving that the intent was fully captured by the, by the set of arithmetic gates would be a, a very a valuable thing for the community too, I believe. That's what the, this paper that I cited does. So, oh, right. Okay, that's great. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, presumably, if you can formalize the high level statement that you want to prove, and also uh, the, so the, the R1CS expression of that, or whatever um, arithmetization you're using, uh, you can then start to prove that they're equivalent or that one is a refinement of the other. Is that right? Yes, I mean the paper that I cite does a compilation, so it takes the high-level statement and then it produces the R1 CS. Um, maybe not the most efficient one, but you don't have to write it yourself. Right, I, I'm thinking more about um, optimizations that uh, that probably are, are not achievable just by compilation that require yeah. some creative input, 
Um, say, say for example, your um, you want your implementation of um, scalar multiplication to use windowing. Um, you'd have to prove that that's correct um, for high level um, statement that that just says that it's a scalar multiplication. Yeah, that can also so, be done. Yeah. Okay, and that's well within the 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 capability of existing tools, is it? No, um, <laughs> it's, I think it's feasible okay. yeah, that tool. It's, uh, it's feasible in principle, but it's, yeah. it's difficult using existing tools, okay. Yeah, we've, we've also done that with uh, in ACL2. So there's, there's a couple of different formalizations in that. Mm -hmm. so, so what actually is, give me an example of the most complicated thing that you've proved along those lines. Anyone? In terms of implementation wise, or in terms of just a, 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 a proof? In, in terms of proving that some non-trivial optimization is correct. Okay, so optimization. Um, this is kind of Linux kernel. Um, no, 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 it, it could be in anything. Um, so, so actually, I want to take, uh, Daria, your question and pose actually the, like to, uh, ask the following to all of you. Uh, what, uh, kind of summarizing this, what is our goal? What do we want to get out of this? Is uh, realistically for the short term, are we, is our goal to just define the concept that uh, zero knowledge proofs rely on in a, a formal way? Is that a reasonable goal? Or do we want to try to do something more uh, ambitious? Uh, such as generate proofs for sp specific protocol, whether it's growth or, or others. Uh, uh, Daniel, maybe we can poll this. You know, we said we'll play around with the idea of polling. Yes, is that, does that sound good? I'm set, I'm set Fabulous. Okay, so Daniel is gonna set up a poll, okay? You vote whether you want, uh, you think the effort should be focused on definitions or whether uh, we should focus on also uh, verification uh, of, of proofs in the setting. So can I say something about that question? Yes. I mean, for me, the, the, I mean, it's nice to think about it as like either definitions or proofs, but I'm, um, Basically, you can define whatever you want, but you will only find out if your definition makes sense if you try to prove anything with it in a formal sense. That's what um, David was talking about. So, um, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I see, exactly. I see your point, but at that, okay, but that's kind of just a. Uh, um, no, no, that's not against this poll. I just wanted to remark. No, no, I understand. No, you have a very good point, a really, really good point, which is you're saying even to understand if your definition makes sense, you want to play around with it and see what exactly. you can do with it. That I agree. Exactly. But, but that's just as a way of making sure that your definition makes sense. Or do we want to actually try to prove, you know, interesting yes. results such as growth 16 is secure or some Stark is secure or anything of that form. So I, I guess my p question is, we want to focus uh, as a team, our, our effort on providing just formal definition that makes sense. And like Sabine said, that will require, of course, to do more than just define. Uh, but the goal is to have kind of good formal definitions or do we want to focus on actually proofs, formal uh, proofs for, for a protocol that we care about? And just if I can, uh, if I can also uh, answer some of the points made by Dara, which I, I, I share actually what, what you said Dara, in the sense that, in my opinion, this is when you start to do optimizations, manual optimizations, that you really need to understand whether you did, you did, you did them right. But yeah. maybe it can, like maybe using formal methods can be a way to, um, so I don't know about crypt um, all about this tool, but uh, I know that sometimes we can generate code from the specifications. And maybe if we have a way to actually just specify the protocol, generate the code out of this specification, and generate test vectors out of this. If, even if this implementation is not the, the most optimized one, we may be able to derive test vectors that we can then use in order to verify the kind of optimized uh, implementation of our protocols. So um, th this may be a way to kind of have the best of both worlds. In, well, uh, well, that's that's certainly useful. Um, uh, in my experience, um, the if your optimization is wrong, it's probably wrong in a, uh, an obscure kind of case that might not be 
plan by the test vector until unless you already know about the corner case. Um, so right. we shouldn't expect too much from that approach. But I, but I agree, it's certainly better than nothing. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's right. I mean, if you forget like a Boolean check in an R1CS or whatever, your, the result is gonna be the same, but uh, maybe uh, this is the this simple um, check uh, can, can, can lead to like exploits or whatever. I, I agree, it's just like maybe a way to conciliate the, the best of both worlds. Uh, I don't know, yeah, good point. One nice thing about uh, formally proving R1CS things is it seems likely that R1CS isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Like. Grot 16, yeah. someone might find improvements. We might, it might um, not be seeing it in a few years from now, but I want CS, I'd be surprised. Uh, and even um, things like Plonk are, they're really not that different from I want CS in terms of what you need to formalize. Um, they're still just, just checking polynomial equations. Um, so yeah, it seems, uh, and you can compile those to I want CS anyway, if you want to apply a, a tool that only works for one CS. So just a quick incision. Uh, we've gone two minutes on the polling. Uh, there's 46% of the participants have voted. If anybody wants to vote, this is the moment. I'm going to end the polling in a second and share the results. So get your votes in, please. <laughs> well, 46% like is nice. Yeah, yeah. 54%. So I guess this is working. That's, okay. that's a higher turnout than many elections. Exactly. <laughs> you cannot close the window unless you vote. Ah, <laughs> you can't abstain. Uh, so Daniel, I think we should wrap up soon. Is that right? Yeah, so I, I, I uh, closed the poll. Um, share results. You should be seeing the results, I believe. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's it's pretty not that pretty close. Yeah, so we have seventy six want to just focus on formalizing kind of the definitions and the schemes, and the and fifty four percent of the voters want to kind of also focus on proofs. Uh, they think it's it's in good time kind of to do that. Okay, yeah. so I guess we have so a lot more to discuss. <laughs> yeah, what what I would suggest since we are also going to wrap up in a, in a second, as you said, but is that uh, as part of the working group, right? We have the working group set up already. I, I encourage everyone to join. This is gonna. This should be part of the discussion, right? If if the initial goal of the working group is to start formalizing at least some example uh, a definition, right, or scheme, maybe pick a scheme, start with the definitions, and and then kind of go to a, a specific theorem. I mean, of course, it's up to the working group, but uh, this this could be outlined as part of the milestones or goals, right? So so is it easier to do that first for? Um things like cryptographic primitives, uh, commitment schemes, say. Um, we, we have a pretty clear definition of what a commit, informal anyway, definition of what a commitment scheme is. So, uh, and we're going to be standardizing some of them. So that would be a good test case, probably. Yeah, I, I think that could be the case. I mean, I wouldn't want to go off the rail and say, let's formalize uh, everything, every primitive in cryptography in some sense, like I, I would be- trying, Right, trying this, be this is why I'm suggesting one thing yeah. that is, is pretty right. well defined. Okay, let's maybe put that as a question to the working group. I don't have a specific opinion right now. Sounds good. So are we, uh, Daniel, are we breaking up now to the groups? Is that the plan? Yes, so uh, thank you all for the discussion. Uh, let's maybe thank see. you. Yeah, thank yeah, you so, thank much, you so guys. much, guys. Um, so, okay, so we're now off to the next session and we're soon gonna break up into our um, um, lightning talks. We will get to uh, hear short talks by the community members. But before that, we have our traditional two minute sponsors intro. And today, the sponsors of the speaking is Calibra. I'm sure most of you already heard about this uh, company. And here with us today is Evan Chang, the director of Calibra Research Group. So Evan, the floor is yours. Hey, I feel like I'm uh, uh, the 